Hi, this is Peter Godfrey Smith. This is a recorded video lecture for Dominic Murphy's bioethics class. It's going to go through my paper, COVID heterodoxy in three layers. It'll go through the main ideas, show a few slides, and then give a kind of update at the end, talk about where I think we are now. Uh, it'll probably go for about 40, 45 minutes or so, maybe a bit less, maybe a bit more. I'm not really sure. I'm just going to roll along and, and see how we go. The paper was written between late 2020 and the end of 2021 uh, in stages uh, as, as things developed. Um, it was posted online. There was a bit of correspondence with people in response to various versions, and it was finally published in late 2021. It hadn't been intended for publication, um, but the editors of Monash Bioethics Review got in touch about that. Um, there is a version that's not the published version on my website still, uh, which is called version 4K, which is in some ways the fullest version. It has some extra material that's not in the published uh, the published version, especially in the notes. The aim of the paper, let me just share a screen. Share the screen and make myself a little bit bigger. The aim of the paper is to look at and develop a something of a dissenting view from COVID policy as it was seen in and has been seen in much of the developed world, especially in relation to lockdowns and similar measures. It doesn't discuss vaccine, uh, vaccines, vaccine mandates, or the controversial topic of the origins of the virus, uh, just um, lockdowns and the like. I have been and still am basically against them, against lockdowns. Now, to say that is to engage in a kind of shorthand. I don't think there's a definite category that's what lockdowns are. There are lots of measures to consider, and we also have to consider a few different kinds of alternatives. Um, people, people in the US have sometimes said and occasionally said to me, uh, uh, in correspondence, that lockdowns never happened, that they're a kind of a myth. Or uh, one critic said in a, in a uh, semi-published response that the category of lockdown is too indefinite to discuss. Uh, I take it that nobody living in Australia or the UK or China says this. Uh, lockdowns are a pretty clear matter there, but it is still best to consider measures one by one. Um, I'll be talking quite a bit about school closures, a bit about uh, curfews, restrictions on travel, restrictions on everyday movement. Uh, that's the way I'll handle it. Also, the aim of the paper was to be general and not only concerned with Australia. So, uh, the three main places that will be discussed are Australia, the US and the UK. I won't say anything about the, the current ongoing situation in China. I'll just talk about those three, uh, those three cases, um, partly because they're the ones I know a little about, but different questions arise in each of these cases, as we'll see. Um, uh, the, the sort of the things I'm against took a somewhat different form in each of the three cases. I should talk a little bit, I think, up front at the outset about the contrasts. Uh, so if lockdowns involve things like school closures and restrictions on movement and forcing most businesses to close um, and so on, what is, what is the contrast? What, you know, what is it to not do that? People sometimes say the contrast is to, uh, quote, let it rip, let the virus rip, so essentially do nothing at all. That's not the contrast I have in mind. Uh, as the paper makes explicit in the opening pages, I think the right goal is and has been to slow the spread of the virus and to protect healthcare systems through a range of measures that are not too destructive in other ways. Uh, destructive of livelihoods, education, uh, 
basic liberties and essential forms of human contact. Um, what might those alternatives look like? Well, there are two main kinds. Uh, one is a kind of a general light touch approach as was seen throughout the pandemic in Sweden, where schools were kept open all through the pandemic uh, in Sweden, except for the last two years of schooling for kids who are essentially 17, 18, that kind of age. Uh, schools were kept open for nearly all ages. Restaurants were allowed to stay open. Movement was not restricted. There were none of the curfew type restrictions that we had in Australia. Uh, that's one way of doing it, a kind of general light touch. Another way, which is just as controversial, um, is what's known as focused protection uh, associated with uh, the Great Barrington Declaration. Uh, this was a very controversial policy proposal uh, it was sub subject to a campaign, uh, a concerted media campaign against it in the US. Um, the, the main idea of focused protection is that you do very different things according to the ages of people. Older people um, are protected. Um, people who are still at work and are old uh, are paid to stay home essentially, uh, kept out of circulation, while younger people according to this plan would live uh, pretty much normally. The, the focus protection proposal was based on the idea that the development of vac vaccines would be slow. The thought was it might take about 18 months for vaccines to come along and lockdowns would not be sustainable for that long. The fact that vaccines came along so quickly uh, uh, changed a lot of stuff. As I'll talk about towards the end of this, um, towards the end of this talk, I have a lot of sympathy with the focused protection idea. My main difference, my main question about it has to do with the role of coercion, essentially, whether it would be done in a coercive way. Part of what I'll be talking about here is what I see as a tendency towards excessive coercion that we've had during the COVID pandemic. Okay, so that's a first discussion of the contrast. It's not that I'm saying I'm against lockdowns and we should just ignore the virus and pretend nothing's happening or, or that we should have done that during the more difficult period. Um, I think the sort of Swedish light touch approach and the, um, and the focused protection idea are both relevant alternatives. A bit more by way of setup. Um, I make, a, I, make a, I make a bunch of biological assumptions, which I take to be fairly mainstream assumptions throughout this. Uh, there's no attempt to minimize the problem of COVID uh, in my picture. COVID is not the flu, but it's massively different in its effects according to the age of people who get it. Um, I think that zero COVID is, uh, was pretty much from the start clearly not a reasonable thing to hope for or aim for. Um, I think that variants will continue to evolve as they do with viruses in general, and that we should expect some future variants to be even more able to evade the protections of current vaccines uh, than the, the current crop, especially Omicron is. So I assume this, I assume this is an ongoing thing. I've always thought that was likely. Okay, there's, as I say, the, the paper's called COVID Heterodoxy in Three Layers, and there are three layers of um, argument, in a sense, which are ordered by what I take to be the contentiousness of their premises. Uh, the first layer, the first set of arguments, makes use of uh, what I think of as fairly ordinary cost-benefit reasoning. I'm not convinced that lockdowns do more good than harm. Um, in assessing this, there's so many things that we could be thinking about. There's so many different kinds of data. There are so many different counterfactuals and so on. Um, but what I'll be focusing on in particular in, in this talk, as well as in the paper, is the proper handling of worst case scenarios, uh, attention to the medium term as well as the short term, and also attention to the peculiar harms associated with inequality, which I think tend to get um, 
tend to get not overlooked, but sort of underappreciated in this setting. So that's the first layer. Then I'll talk a bit about uh, infringements on um, what I think of as basic freedoms, basic liberties uh, that are associated with lockdowns. And thirdly, and most controversially, some ideas about what I call the shape of life. The, uh, the idea that COVID policy should pay, should have paid and should continue to pay as it continues to develop more attention to the distinctive roles of stages in life, the, 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 the kinds of uh, roles seen when one is younger, the, what makes life meaningful uh, at that stage, and also the kinds, uh, the, the distinctive kinds of activities and uh, seen in the last, later stages and the last stages of life and what makes, meaningful, what makes life meaningful at that time. Uh, the, the main argument of the third layer is the idea that if you think some activities have a special role in making life worth living, then risk reduction in itself is not always something to promote when it suppresses those particular activities. And that's true in relation to both uh, older people and younger people. Okay, let's talk first about the first layer, which applies a sort of basic cost benefit kind of analysis. We're asking, uh, do uh, lockdowns, ha have lockdowns tended to do more, more good than harm? I think it's reasonable to suspect that they did and continue to do more harm than good, but it's very hard to say. Um, in particular cases, and also hard to say in general. I mentioned earlier, and I discussed in more detail in the paper, the fact that uh, Sweden and Florida in the US can be seen as experiments in a way, uh, almost kind of natural experiments, although it was, a, it was a policy matter that did it. They both imposed a much lighter touch than uh, their neighbors and other places in general with respect to behavioral dis uh, behavioral restriction. And I think people are going to be doing the accounting on Sweden and Florida in different ways for quite a long time. Um, I would say the following is not controversial in each case. It wasn't a disaster for them at all. Uh, in the case of Sweden in particular, Sweden did not do as well as its immediate neighbours, uh, which were more restrictive in their behaviours, in particular, which had school closures for a while, which had business closures for a while. It did not do as well as its immediate neighbours, but it did well by European standards in general. Um, I th you know, it, it's, it's around the, the better part of the middle range with respect to how well uh, it did in, in relation to other European countries. What counts as doing well here? I mean, this is, of course, a very vexed question. Um, I think the most sensible way to think about this is, um, I'll just stop the share for a while because that slide's been up for a while. The most sensible way to think about this is with the concept of excess death. Um, excess death during some period of time is the rate of death in a population over and above what's been typical uh, in comparable times. So this can be measured by looking at the average of years over the last five years and looking at a particular year in relation to that average. Uh, it can also be done in other ways. <clears throat> if you do that calculation for Sweden, uh, then uh, during the year 2020, they had about 7% higher uh, than usual mortality during that time. So they did have excess death. They had more than normal by about 7%. And that's, that involves uh, a lot of people living less long than they otherwise would have. So it is a, a serious outcome. It's not a disaster though, I take it. And it, they did better than much of Europe. Uh, the situation I think in Florida in the US is roughly similar. There's a bit about this in different versions of the paper, uh, all of which are archived on my website. It didn't do fantastically, but it was no disaster. <clears throat> and much of the time what was being claimed was that it would be a disaster to do anything less than the kind of more stringent lockdown type restrictions that other places were doing. Okay, that's, that's a sort of first pretty empirical uh, 
set of ideas. Now I want to talk uh, about two particular themes in this first layer. The first is somewhat philosophical and has to do with the role of worst case scenarios and worst case reasoning. I think this was a, a big problem, a big thing in discussions, um, both inside policy circles and also has, as things were presented to the, the broader public. In the area of COVID, a lot of policy was guided by the need to consider worst case scenarios. People thought, you know, how bad could this get? Uh, and if there's some chance of things uh, getting really bad, then measures should be targeted at that possibility. You, there was a certain amount of um, policy based on worst case scenario reasoning. This was quite explicit in the UK, so you can read quite a lot about the role of worst case scenario reasoning in the UK. The philosopher Jonathan Birch has a paper about it. Now, the problem I have with all of this was the fact that when people applied worst case scenario reasoning to the harms of COVID, they did not think about possible worst case scenarios in the other direction. What are the possible worst case scenarios associated with the policies that we might bring in in response to our concerns about COVID. Uh, school closures uh, and general economic breakdown um, would be the big things here. And here I think time spans important. It's not that I think that short school closures, short periods of restriction, people being out of work for short periods are associated with really significant worst case scenarios that might be socially and politically disastrous. But I do think that once measures of this kind go on for a long time, once they go on, to, on for many months or a year or more than a year, two years in, in some cases, then it really is true that you have to think about how, you know, just as with COVID, you have to worry how bad could things get with respect to the disruption of normal ec economic life, normal political activity, education and so on you then you also have to ask then um, how bad could things get and a problem I had all the way through the sort of central years of the pandemic was that people didn't seem to ask that question they asked worst case scenario questions about the immediate harms that the virus could do and did not ask worst case scenario questions about the harms that our response lockdowns might do and I think of this just as a, a as simply an error now, I accept that once you start thinking about worst case scenarios and the different kinds of harms in each direction, it's not as if things are completely symmetrical. In particular, the sorts of harms that might be associated with pessimistic thinking about lockdowns involve effects that are quite a bit further downstream, that you know, take, take years to play out, that are filtered through other causes, um, and that as a consequence of that might be subject to other measures. There might be things that might be done uh, much later that would have a significant effect on the, um, the pessimistic possible outcomes on the lockdown side. And that was not really true with respect to the virus itself. There, everything was happening uh, um, somewhat more quickly. For example, I'll be refereeing a paper over the next week or so which argues that lockdowns, including school closures, were reasonable. But now that we're past it, there should be a large scale project of paying reparations to younger people, to the people who had to pay the price. Uh, there should be a transfer of wealth from older to younger people in response uh, to the sacrifices that were made. Now, that would be an example of trying to you know, act quite a bit later to avert um, what I do think of as possibly, possibly very serious harms that could come from the lockdown. And that's an interesting idea. You know, I think that would in some ways be quite a good idea. Um, um, so that's, that's an example of the ways that the, the kinds of pessimistic reasoning on each side are not wholly symmetrical. Next thing I wanna talk about in a little bit of detail is school closures. Uh, closure of schools in, uh, in, in response to COVID. Uh, as I say in the, in the 
the paper, if you uh, read that section, because I'm someone whose sort of life was built so much out of good educational opportunities, and I'm so aware of the benefits I got from those, I'm very concerned about the educational harms that lockdowns did and public school closures for uh, primary school or elementary school, to use the American term, and high school kids. Uh, that was really, I think, one of possibly the worst thing that was done in the developed world in response to COVID. Now, it, it, it varies a lot by country. And the place where this was really serious was in the US. Uh, for several reasons, it was more serious there. Um, they had I mean, lots of kids in public schools lost the best part of two years, and they lost the best part of two years of education in circumstances where it really matters. Now, all the data that's been collected on the effects of school closures on in other settings, pre-COVID settings, suggests that even short school closures can have very bad effects downstream on people's life prospects. And long school closures are particularly bad. Um, these effects are strongly affected by inequality. And that's partly why I'm so concerned about the US case, where inequality in the area of education was already so high, and it was made much worse. It was exacerbated uh, by school closures. This was partly because uh, private schools for rich kids didn't close as much. They were able to stay open in lots of circumstances where public schools did not. Secondly, um, schools with poor kids uh, tended to be closed for you know, really long periods of time. Um, and school closures there were subject to a lot of political wrangling. Also very importantly, and this is becoming more and more clear, uh, wealthy kids in the US were able to continue learning a fair amount even when their schools were closed. Uh, they are more likely to live in, in household settings that lend themselves to remote learning uh, with a bit of privacy and quiet, good Wi-Fi, uh, not, too much, uh, not too much in the way of distraction. And a lot of poor kids who were plunged into remote learning were just really, uh, their education just stopped. Uh, let me go back to the uh, screen share. Um, the, uh, this New York Times article came out just, uh, this New York Times article came out just uh, last week or so, and it's the most recent in a long series of New York Times articles about the effects of school closures in the US. And the message is, is well, there's a sort of double message here, uh, which is completely clear. Firstly, that, um, that kids lost a huge amount of really important uh, education as a consequence of being forced to stay home. Um, and secondly, this was avoidable. Uh, even if one thinks that some of the measures associated with lockdown policies uh, were either necessary or, you know, at least did something concretely beneficial. In the case of the US, it probably did very little good at all, um, as this New York Times article um, makes explicit. Extended school closures appear to have done much more harm than good. Uh, this could, this was pretty clear, certainly by the latter part of 2020. In places where schools did reopen relatively quickly it didn't much affect the spread of COVID in those communities. Uh, and, and it was what something that became particularly clear is that in much of Europe, especially uh, non-English speaking continental Europe, France, Germany, uh, Northern Europe, Scandinavia, and so on, schools were very quick to, were much quicker to reopen than they were elsewhere, even if they had been closed for a while. And uh, it didn't seem to lead to significant outbreaks. So school closures, especially in settings where inequality is you know, a, a big factor and the US is top of the list there, I think were quite disastrous and were probably uh, the, 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 the lockdown-like measure that did the most 
harm in the developed world. I mean, I, there's not much in my paper about the developing world, but in the developed world, especially the three countries I'm talking about, US, Australia, and um, UK, this was what did the most harm. Switching briefly to Australia, um, I think it is worth uh, uh, um, noting how school closures were sometimes handled and sometimes discussed in the Australian, in the Australian setting. Uh, school closures did happen here, of course, especially in Victoria, but also elsewhere. And I, I don't think anything like the right amount of care was taken in working out whether this was a necessary policy. Uh, the really extreme case here, which I have on the slide is from Queensland, where um, the chief health officer in Queensland, Dr. Young, was in favor of shutting down schools at a certain point, while accepting that although schools were not a high risk environment for the spread of the virus, she thought they still should be closed down as a kind of messaging uh, measure to help people understand the general gravity of the situation. Uh, that quote at the bottom of the slide, I think is, uh, to me, it's very shocking. Sometimes it's more than just the science and the health, it's about the messaging. So what the chief health officer in Queensland was making fully explicit was that the harms um, of school closures were being done to kids not for their safety and not really directly because of the spread of COVID in schools um, or not entirely, but partly at least because it would, it would just sort of send a message to people to take the whole thing seriously. Um, that really is a kind of sacrificing of the interests of kids, the vital interests of kids uh, for, uh, uh, for something that I think did um, very little concrete good at all. Okay, I'll leave that slide up for a little bit while I go on later. Okay, that's most of what I wanted to talk about in the context of sort of layer one of the arguments where uh, we're just engaged in ordinary cost benefit reasoning, not particularly concerned with either liberties, which I'll talk about next, or some contentious ideas having to do with young and the, the roles of young and old stage, life stages and things like that. We're just talking about relatively straightforward cost benefit questions. Let me just say two things though that I think are worth adding to this discussion of layer one. So firstly, as the, especially in the later stages of the, uh, the lockdown period in, um, in places like Australia and the UK, the argument that was given more and more as the argument that was made uh, was that um, it was all about the protection of the hospital system, the healthcare system. So after a certain point, the idea that the virus could be eradicated altogether, I think got less and less currency uh, in sensible circles. And uh, people accepted that we we're gonna end up living with this virus uh, at some stage why then should we continue the lockdowns? Well, the argument was that um, it's necessary to slow the process in a way that takes uh, excessive pressure off the healthcare system. Um, I do wanna make a comment about this. There's some stuff in, about the details in the paper, but my general comment is, I think the argument is a reasonable one in principle. I think that argument was reasonable in a way that, for example, the goal of eradicating the virus completely has never been reasonable. So I take seriously uh, the flatten the curve type argument about healthcare systems. The problem came to be that this argument was used to justify any amount of restriction applied for very long periods of time. Uh, it was never sort of put into the mix of costs and benefits uh, with the rest, uh, for example, including school closures. Um, and it was never, and this is also important, it was usually opposed to the uh, let it rip alternative where nothing was done, rather than a sort of lighter touch, a more voluntarist approach uh, to reduction of contact between people, 
something which can be su sustained for much longer with less damage to the social fabric. So I think that argument about the healthcare system, it starts out as sensible, but it's allowed to have uh, a kind of indefinitely large role. And that's partly because I think when people imagine uh, doing something different, they're imagining doing nothing at all in response to the virus. And I think that was never the relevant alternative. Secondly, this is still just continuing on the, um, on this first layer. One thing I'm often told, something that's often said to me around this stage in the conversation is, you know, what about long COVID? Uh, even if you're uh, not too concerned about death rates, uh, what about long COVID? And my response to this is that, uh, well, it's, it's a serious question. I think we're still learning about long COVID. I think it's not looking as alarming as it looked uh, 12 months or so ago, but it's still a, a, a very serious concern. However, in some COVID-related discussions, uh, the, the unique harm of mortality, the unique harm of death, is used as, an, uh, as, as the basis for an argument that, you know, this is really the most important thing we have to prevent. This is not an ordinary harm. It's, it's, it, it's a particularly great harm and other policy considerations, other harms and costs, cost to education, uh, they don't have the same standing when we think of them in, in contrast to saving every life possible. And I don't agree with that in a sort of unqualified way, but I certainly get it. In the case of long COVID though, we're not talking about these uh, unique harms anymore. We're talking about ordinary medical harms, things that do have to be put in the mix with the consequences of closing schools and economic disruption and all the rest. The, the sort of uniqueness of the harm has gone away. Um, so my attitude to long COVID all the way through this has been, am I concerned about it? Yes, but given what we know and given what we knew back then, it's never been enough to force people to shut down their businesses, force people to, uh, force kids not to go to school and things like that. Okay, all of that was layer one. And now we'll get on to layer two. And here's how I think of the relationship between that first set of arguments and the second set of arguments. I think it's one of the features of liberal democracies, of liberal society, that there's one set of questions you can ask you might ask about, you know, what would we like people to do? You know, how would we like things to go? What, what, what's the sort of goal we would like to further? And a second and somewhat separate set of questions you then ask, you know, what are the coercive measures that we can reasonably take or just, justifiably take to get people uh, uh, to what we think they should be doing? Uh, what kinds of measures um, are legitimate even assuming that the outcome would be good. For example, and this is the most discussed and I think reasonably discussed example, you could have some measures that might do uh, things that are generally beneficial in some average sense, but might mistreat a minority or impinge on really basic rights. And that usually rules them out in most policy settings. You have to ask not just where you want people to end up, but uh, you have to ask about the legitimacy of the tools that you use to try to get them there. And I think that a second kind of argument against lockdowns is one based on the infringement uh, that lockdowns involve on basic everyday liberties of this kind. Uh, I have in mind partly the sorts of liberties that normally enjoy political protection, such as freedom to protest, um, uh, freedom of association associated with other kinds seen in political settings and so on. But I also have in mind just ordinary everyday things like, you know, freedom to sort of visit your friends, to roam around, to sort of uh, just engage in everyday behaviors that involve autonomy and choice. Now, in the first layer discussed, first layer of argument discussed a minute ago, I said that, you know, if school closures are probably the biggest um, concrete harmful thing that 
lockdowns in the developed world involved, then the US is where that happened in particular in the most damaging way. In the case of infringement on basic liberties, if you, if, when that's the sort of focus of our concern, it's very much not the US where things went bad. It was Australia here, among other places, also France, uh, various European countries, um, and, and the UK as well, where we had, I think, extraordinary excesses seen in the behaviours of the police and in how um, coercion and enforcement of lockdowns was applied. Okay, I'm going to share the screen again. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to show a bunch of slides to remind people of uh, how bad things got, especially in Australia, in relation to policing. And argue my argument is essentially, even if you think lockdowns uh, were justifiable in relation, uh, when thinking about basic cost benefit reasoning, some of this stuff just should never happen. This is not, this is not uh, something that should happen in a liberal democratic society. Okay, firstly, we have the arrest of Zoe Bueller. Uh, this was in Victoria. Um, most of my, most of not, not all of my examples of, of bad police uh, policing involve Victoria. Zoe Bueller was involved in an anti-lockdown protest and she posted on Facebook uh, information about an anti-lockdown protest. Uh, in her post on Facebook, she said everyone who was coming to this was supposed to wear a mask and that was there was supposed to be social distancing at this anti-lockdown protest. The police turned up at her apartment, arrested her, as you can see, in her pyjamas. She was pregnant at the time. Um, and she I don't know what eventually happened with the case, but the arrest itself, I think, was a really disgraceful piece of policing uh, that happened. At, in this relatively early stage in Victoria. Okay, the arrest of Zoe Bueller is one. Here's one also in Victoria that I um, only learned about recently. Uh, stories of this kind are coming to light. And this one has to do with fines and the way that, you know, we don't always think of fines as that big a deal, but if you don't have a lot of money, then fines are a big deal. And some of the fines that were given for lockdown violations were completely unreasonable. Uh, there's the link there to this story. This is also a, uh, a Melbourne case. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go through it. I'm not sure if the slide's readily visible. It says a 25 year old single mother was living in transitional housing with her three children, all aged under five. So single mother, three children. Uh, she had endured family violence, had a history of depression and anxiety, was missing mental health checkups because she was looking after her kids, probably also just because of restrictions from lockdown itself. And one day it says when the youngest would not stop crying, the burden became too much. Amala took the children to the outskirts of Melbourne to stay with extended family. Okay, this is in July 2020. And Melbourne, uh, the most or until at least at one stage, up until recently, the most lockdown place on earth was in the middle of one of its strict lockdowns. And she was fined uh, about $1,600 for this behavior, driving the kids to stay with relatives to try to, uh, I assume, do some good for both her and their mental health and stress levels. Uh, I think that's a... Com the fact that that wasn't seen as a reasonable thing to do, I think, is completely outrageous. I also note a line in the ABC report that um, uh, I didn't mention in my first run through. It says the police soon knocked on the door, alerted by watchful neighbours. All the way through these uh, Australian lockdowns, the police continually encouraged people to do this, uh, to report on their neighbours, to report on family members. Um, the idea that this is a kind of destructive thing to have happening in relation to the social fabric either didn't cross people's minds or they didn't care. And um, it's alarming that Australians were so 
willing to do this, that her neighbors did report this woman in her difficult circumstances to the police. Uh, it's shocking that the police were encouraging people to do this. And lastly, I think it's disgraceful that the fine is still in place. So the ABC story says the fine continues to hang over Amala's head nearly two years later. Okay, here's another example, which is not quite so grim in some ways, but is of course grim in others. Um, Australia had state border closures of a kind that I take it were almost unthinkable before COVID came along. Uh, Western Australia was the place that had the most extreme state border closures. Um, here is a story from the Sydney Morning Herald. A West Australian teenager who sped through a COVID border checkpoint at 230 kilometres an hour, which is impressive, after repeatedly being refused entry into the state to see his pregnant and terminally ill mother has copped a lifetime driving suspension and been fined $3,000. Uh, that is what happened. I, I, I read a couple of accounts of this anecdote. The guy had been trying, he was a teenager trying to get across the state border to visit his pregnant and terminally ill mother. Uh, this is an immigrant family uh, and eventually just decided he was just going to do it. Uh, so he got hold of a car and sped through the checkpoint. Um, I don't mind him being fined $3,000 in this case. I think driving at 230 kilometers an hour uh, through a checkpoint should be treated with some degree of serious. But the fact that he was refused entry into the state repeatedly to see his pregnant and terminally ill mother, I think is another one of these completely unreasonable, uh, inflexible pieces of enforcement that, that became common in Australia during this time. Uh, it wasn't just Australia, this is a famous photo. It may become, at least a famous photo in, in anti-lockdown circles. It may become uh, perhaps one of the defining photos of this whole period. It was taken by a Times photographer. Uh, this was an arrest of a woman at the Sarah Everhart vigil in the UK last year in 2021. Sarah Everhart was a woman who was murdered uh, by a policeman, as it turned out. They finally found the guy. Uh, it was a, a brutal murder. And this protest was one that was uh, trying to raise awareness of the safety issues that women have, uh, not just in relation to the police, but more broadly, the, 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 the physical safety of women in the UK. Uh, it was a masked, well-behaved protest, and the police came down like a ton of bricks and arrested a bunch of people, uh, including this woman here. Okay. Uh, this sort of thing did not happen so much in the US. It did happen in, well, it, Australia and the UK uh, certainly had forms of policing that I just think never should have been uh, allowed to uh, become part of the enforcement practice in response to a problem like this in a liberal democratic society. Um, that's part of the kind of thing I have in mind when I, uh, I talk about the suppression of liberties, the unreasonableness of coercion measures, the fact that the question, what would you like people to do and the question, you know, what are reasonable measures we can take to get people to do what we want them to do? The separation between those two questions just com got completely lost in Australia uh, and to some extent the UK uh, during this period. In America, that distinction is taken, I think, habitually more seriously. And it's also the case that policing in the US is so fraught in many settings that I think stuff like we were seeing on those slides in Australia never, just never would have flown in the US. Um, I remember quite early during the, um, the US you know, quasi lockdowns on the East Coast that uh, the, uh, the police in Brooklyn, New York City were, were instructed to start to enforce um, a kind of stay at home measure where people weren't allowed to sort of just sit, you know, sit on the steps outside their apartments and things like that. And some high-ranking police, uh, police 
police official in Brooklyn said, are you seriously expecting us to try to, try to prevent this from happening? It just would not have been possible uh, in a place like Brooklyn. And uh, in response to that, I say, good for Brooklyn. Okay, that's the second layer. And now I'll talk about the third layer. I see that I'm gonna go on beyond my uh, roughly 40 minute uh, projected time, but I'm not too concerned about that. Okay, the third, the third set of arguments I'll talk about, uh, I, I see this as the most controversial part of my picture. Uh, so this is the third layer of argument and the, the title I've given it is the shape of life. Um, it starts from the uh, general fact, not controversial, that the median age of COVID related death in developed countries tends to be around 80 or so, uh, a bit higher in many, a bit lower in the US, but similar to the life expectancy. Uh, that's about the time that the median uh, age of death from COVID occurs. While of course, most of the costs of lockdown fall on younger people, school closures especially, but lots of other stuff. And let me say a little bit about the lots of other stuff. Um, one of the things that I think went missing from discussion of COVID policy was a sense of the distinctive roles that different stages in life play, especially in, in sort of uh, developed Western democracies, but to some extent, you know, all over. Um, school closures are for me the biggest, the biggest ill of lockdown-like policies in this area. But there's a lot to be said also about the situation of people who've left school, people who are in their late teens and 20s, uh, I assume that most of the people I'm talking to right now uh, are in that category. This is a stage of life in developed democratic societies that has a distinctive role of its own. This is the time that a person is starting to explore the possible paths they might take into economic life, choosing a career or pursuing further education to then make their way into a career. And secondly, finding the beginning of a path through the tangle that involves sexuality, close partnerships, uh, family, starting a family and uh, domestic life more broadly. And I think that side of the harm of lockdowns, the fact that those particular life forming activities were so suppressed uh, especially in countries like Australia, especially in Victoria in Australia, but in Australia, in the UK, in, in much of the US, not all of the US, uh, also in places like France. I think of this as a really under underappreciated harm. I think that in the area of schooling, first of all, but also in this post-school area, one of the chief responsibilities of older people who've established their place, who now have power, who've gotten themselves settled, is acting in a way that maintains open pathways for the young, uh, not constraining and degrading and narrowing their opportunities, making sure that within the mix of costs and benefits that is used to assess any particular policy measure, one of the important ones is maintaining this kind of openness of pathway for people at those earlier stages in life. That I think is, uh, was lost. A related issue, less frequently discussed, but occasionally made very stark by examples is more something that had to do with the situation of older people. So if it's true that when you're in your sort of twenties, then it's a very important thing that you're sort of making your way through the sort of tangle of career-related, family-related, sexuality-related, you know, path explorations. It's just as true that towards the end of life, uh, when one is old and uh, more infirm, companionship and contact with loved ones is, is absolutely fundamental. For, for, any, for many people, it's much of what it's worth being alive for. That's what makes each day valuable. And even if you don't see those people every day, it's the prospect of maintaining those connections uh, 
uh, that makes life worth living. You've lived your life, you've built what you've built, you've done what you've done with companions, with people who've been close to you. And in these later stages, this is a really important part of uh, the meaningfulness of day-to-day -day life. And for many older people, some extra risks are worth taking if it means you can stay in contact with people, with these people who make your life meaningful. But all through, or through much of COVID, that choice was taken out of people's hands. Uh, the decision not to allow visitors into aged care homes and into many hospital settings, I think was surely a source of a huge amount of uh, misery over the course of the pandemic. Uh, I, I, I know of many people and I've heard of a great many more people who said, you know, look, I'm not very concerned about increasing my risk of dying of COVID. Um, if it means I can, I can stay in touch with people, if I had the option of maintaining that contact. Um, dying alone is a terrible thing. Some people will end up in that situation despite whatever policies might be in place. And that is a very sad thing. But when a policy imposes that, uh, I, I think it's, you know, it, it's a much worse thing and should not have happened. So we have an argument about preserving openness of paths for the young and an argument about maintaining the uh, meaningful contact uh, for older people. Now, the first of those, the argument for the prioritization of the young is related to a very controversial part of COVID policy, which has to do with whether um, we should think that uh, young people's lives might be more valuable than older people's lives or, or something, something like that. And you might wonder whether some of the considerations I'm bringing up here uh, do have that role of sort of giving uh, more value to the lives of the young than to the lives of the old. Now, maybe that's not how it sounds because I was emphasizing the, the distinctive harms that were done to people at the end of life by lockdowns as well. But let's just focus on the, the situation with the young. And here I do want to make a kind of philosophical point, uh, um, something which I think is, is poorly appreciated. So I basically endorse a commitment to the idea that all lives should be accorded the same value in our society. I think there's, there's, a, there's something sensible being said when one talks about the equal value of lives in a society. But a life is a thing that, that has a shape, that extends, that has distinctive activities and roles associated with it at earlier and later stages. So to say that all lives have or should have the same value is not the same as saying that all the same efforts and investments should be applied at every stage, at every stage of every life. Instead, it's to say that all those lives, each of which has its shape with a certain role for the younger stages, a certain role for the later, should be counted equally in our attempts to handle opportunities, freedoms, costs, costs risks, and so on. Uh, each of those things with its life, its human lifelike shape should be accorded the same value. Um, and for that reason, there is a kind of prioritization of the young that I think is a natural thing to uh, be thinking about in the context of COVID policy. Um, for example, you know, in the realm of health policy, if someone asks how much we should spend to save a life, if you think about it in a non-superficial way, you eventually have to grapple with the fact that saving a life is a misdescription of what we're trying to do. We all die eventually. No lives can be saved as wholes. The health policy questions that are properly uh, asked are ones about extending lives, preserving lives, making lives um, you know, richer and uh, featuring less suffering than they might and so on. We can't save literally lives, but we can save life years and we can improve life years. Once we're thinking this way, in terms of uh, extending, preserving, saving life years, the ages of, affected, of people affected by the policies we're talking about really do matter and should be factored in, uh, should not be ignored. 
The point I'm making is in some ways familiar because it's an application of the reasoning that leads to concern about uh, intergenerational inequality or intergenerational theft, uh, to use the more loaded term. There's been quite a lot of discussion of that in the last week or so in the context of the Australian federal election. I'm, I'm always glad to see it. I think it's quite an important and underrated uh, concern. Intergenerational inequality or intergenerational theft is, is what you have when policies prevent the adult years of presently young people from having desirable features that an earlier generations of adults enjoyed. It's what you have when young people are not going to have the same uh, quality of pathway open to them as the current older people had in, you know, earlier in their, in their process. As I say, I'm glad to see it on the table in the current federal election. I think it's a big deal, a big, a bigger deal in the context of COVID policy and lockdowns. Okay, that's most of what I want to say, and I'll, I, I do want to give my little update. Uh, let me just say a little word about the relations philosophically between the three kinds of arguments, the cost benefit stuff, the liberty stuff, and the, um, the shape of life stuff. I don't think that this third layer, that what I call the sort of shape of life side of things, I don't think of it as providing a kind of separate argument of its own that's added to the other two. The other two can, in a way, be their own arguments. You can have a cost-benefit argument for or against lockdowns, and you can have a somewhat separate argument about liberties. You know, suppose you know, do lockdowns do more good than harm? The answer might be yes, but you might still say, nonetheless, we shouldn't do them because they involve too much uh, infringing on basic liberties. There is that separation. The third layer, I don't see of as adding a separate argument. It's more something that sort of should condition the way we think about the other arguments, especially the first argument. I think cost-benefit reasoning should not be done in a kind of crude way. It should be done in a more sophisticated way. Um, part of that sophistication involves attending closely to inequality. The fact that even if you know, an average outcome is not too bad, you might have some people having a shocking outcome while others as in the case of COVID, became stupendously rich uh, during lockdowns. There's that, and there's also this stuff about the shape of life. Okay, final couple of minutes. Let me say a little bit um, about 2022, uh, you know, roughly a year on from the time when most of the paper was written. What do I think now? How do I think things look now? Well, let's talk about each of the three countries um, that I've focused on US, UK and Australia, because I think there are differences here as well. In the case of the US, I think the public school closures were just a terrible mistake. They didn't achieve much at all. Uh, the US had a hard time during COVID. Uh, uh, it's not over, but it certainly has had a, a hard time um, up until now. I don't see much defense anymore of the school closures. I used to get emails uh, in response to my earlier draft saying, of course, I'd like to support uh, opening of schools, but it's necessary to close them. I think that's done. I think everyone now accepts that that was simply a mistake. Um, the bigger questions in the US now that are ongoing concern vaccine mandates. This talk's not going to discuss that. I, I do have opinions on that matter, but I'm going to leave that aside for now. In the US, the school thing was the biggest thing. Um, and I think in retrospect, it was a big mistake. In the UK, it's in some ways in between the US and Australia cases with respect to the things I'm talking about here. They also had a hard time with COVID, lots and lots of deaths, lots of, uh, lots of lives uh, shortened in tragic ways. They closed their schools, not as much and not as destructively as occurred in the public school system in the US. And the, the role of inequality is less also. In the US, one of the things that was wrong with the school closures was the way it, it, it sort of re-established inequalities that with enormous effort had been slowly being reduced. Uh, the UK system it was, was not like that. Well, the, the UK situation was not like that. 
partly because you didn't have a situation where private schools could just go their own way, uh, which to some extent uh, did occur, not, not all the time, but as I understand it, to some extent did occur, especially in the later stages in the, in the US. So the rich kids were doing much better. You had these excesses of policing in the UK. Um, I don't know if there was anything, um, well, actually I'm not really sure how to make comparisons between the worst of the US and the worst of the Australian cases. The, um, the suppression of protests was very bad in the UK. Uh, so it's a kind of in-between case, but let's now, let's now talk a bit about Australia. Now, unlike the UK and unlike the US, um, we, did, we did well concretely in many respects. Uh, we had nothing like the same rate of deaths and serious illnesses because the virus was kept out uh, to a large extent until the vaccines, which came along faster than expected, um, had been distributed, you know, even taking into account the many deficiencies of the Australian vaccine rollout. It was nonetheless a, a mostly vaccinated population that confronted COVID in a wholesale way. And it was also late enough that we were dealing with Omicron um, rather than the more dangerous variants. Um, so things you know, it, it's impossible to, not, to not deny, I think, that in some ways Australia did well. The economic side of things did not go as badly as I feared. I thought we'd be looking at a worse economic situation than we currently are. Um, the fact that a kind of mini resource boom, export boom came along at a helpful time and funded to some extent, many of the handouts that had been given was, you know, enormously helpful and I, I'm, I'm glad it happened. In all these countries, there might be a kind of slow burn disaster economically coming along as a consequence of inflation, uh, political disruption, et cetera. And um, uh, in the US in particular, one has to worry. But you know, I don't deny in the Australian case that we, um, we got some benefits from the mixture of measures uh, that we imposed. So let's now ask, you know, would I have done things differently? Um, where with the information available at the time, I would have done things differently because you know, I've told you what I think about what reasonable measures are, but looking at the kind of ways in which Australia did benefit from its mix of policies, would I still have done things differently? And well, here is my answer to those questions. I think that in Australia, we did some things that should not have been done under any circumstances. We did some things that sh you should not do at all. We should not have prevented citizens from coming home. Um, also shouldn't have prevented them from leaving the country. But to prevent Australian citizens from coming into Australia in the way that was done um, was a kind of real and permanent diminishment of the status of um, Australian citizenship and residency. So, you know, even though I accept it did some good. I think this is, this, this is a kind of thing we should never do. I think we did some things you should only do in the face of vastly worse problems than COVID. Um, and here I have in mind the sorts of things I talked about in the area of policing. Uh, the Melbourne two week total lockdown of, of some public housing towers. I didn't put a slide in about that. I meant to, but I forgot to do that. Um, uh, where people for two weeks, a largely immigrant community in high rise public housing weren't allowed to sort of leave the apartments they were in at all. Uh, sorry, leave the building at all. Um, that kind of complete and total physical lockdown, I think is something that was unjustifiable except in response to a, a problem of, of an entirely different order. Um, I think the curfews that were in place uh, in Victoria uh, and in some part, in quite large parts of Sydney, um, in Sydney during 2021, uh, curfews of that kind should, should never be used except in response to sort of vastly worse problems than this. And I think there were some things that shouldn't have been done because there was no point in doing. It. And that's basically how I think of school closures. Um, if Australia had maintained its, uh, I think, largely unjustifiable border closures, 
or had done something that was justifiable with a larger intake and quarantine system in relation to borders, there wouldn't have been much point in having schools closed, as we saw from that uh, Queensland quote from the chief health officer up there. Schools, it turns out, don't do that much. And schools were being closed uh, in part for messaging reasons to sort of make a point to the larger population. So there's some things we should that we did that we shouldn't have done at all. Some things we did that we shouldn't have done except that shouldn't we should never do except in response to much worse problems than this, where a kind of Sweden counterfactual is the is a relevant alternative there. And there were some things that shouldn't have been done because there was no point in doing them. Uh, what should have been done? Either that kind of focused protection idea I talked about earlier, or a, a, just a more voluntarist, lighter touch approach. Um, a number of Northern European countries, uh, although we didn't go as so far as Sweden, managed to have a lighter touch than Australia for much longer and did very well. Um, one thing I do wonder about, I, I do think of this as a genuine moral dilemma in this setting, has to do with the role of coercion and its relationship to risky behaviours at the end of life. You know, I'm haunted quite a lot by quotes and videos from um, older people, especially in the UK, who insisted they wanted to take a risk and stay in touch with people. Um, it was, you know, it was worth some reduction in lifespan to maintain meaningful human contact uh, during this period, and they weren't allowed to. Some of the sort of focused protection measures that I generally support, um, it's hard to work out how to balance the protection side with what I think of as the reasonable preservation of individual choice and autonomy. And that brings up again these questions about what makes life meaningful at different stages in one's life. Okay, I have gone on for quite a bit longer than I intended, um, but I will stop there. Um, I'll be doing, I'm happy to answer questions in various forums uh, and I'm grateful to Dominic for having me uh, virtually visit his class.